right, it is time to begin. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I got love like an ocean, love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got love like an ocean, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got love like an ocean, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. Hi, everybody. Good to see you out and about this morning and come to worship with us this morning. It's always fun to, to be with the family, isn't it? As you notice, we've got proof behind us that we did have a VBS, and it was a wonderful VBS. We had kids just crawling off the wall everywhere. We had a lot of fun, and just sitting out there watching this, these skits and the waves going back and forth, I almost got seasick just watching. <laughs> Peter walking on the water and denying the Lord and then loving the Lord. It was all kinds of good stuff. Hey, we just had a wonderful time. Thanks for sending your kids to be with us. And if you weren't with us this year, try to plan on making it next year. But we had a lot of fun. I just, you know, you sit back here and you think, man, I wish I was a kid again. Well, oh, and then I think, I am. <laughs> uh, anyway. We appreciate you being here this morning. Welcome for all of those that are watching online. We thank you for watching and, and uh, being with us this morning also. We do have a couple of announcements to make. Uh, I was told this morning that Kathy uh, Nolan's brother, Don Adams, is going to have a heart cath this Wednesday, so we need to keep him in our prayers, if you would, please. So let's go to our Father and pray, and then I'm going to give a couple of scriptures here for our call to worship. Father, we thank you for the love that you provide for us and, and give to us each and every day. We thank you, Father, for the VBS that has just taken place and all the people that participated and made it happen and, and all the people that came to, to be involved. We just thank you for the workers. We thank you for the, the message that you gave to us through your holy word. We thank you, Father, for the blessings we have in Jesus Christ. We just thank you that we're a family, that we are one of the, part of this church that Jesus died for. We thank you that we can be called Christians. We pray that we can live up to that name. Father, we do ask you to be with Don as he has his heart cat on Wednesday that we just talked about, that they, whatever they do, whatever they find would be uh, good, and whatever they, they do for him can come out in good shape. Father, we just ask you to be with our sick about our number and be with those in the hospital, those that we need to think of. We need to check our bulletins and look at those names each and every week and realize that we always have somebody from our family that is in need of our prayers. Father, we just ask you to be with us in our worship this morning. We pray that you would help us and worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that we might have our hearts and our minds involved with the songs, with the prayers, with the communion, and with the message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20 and 21 says this for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power of he that he has even to subject to all things unto himself then you go over and read first John chapter 3 Verse 2, it says this, 
Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as yet what we shall be. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him just as he is. Both these scriptures talk about when Jesus comes back, we're going to have a body like his. We don't exactly know exactly what it's going to be like, but whatever it is, it's going to be good enough for me, because that's the one Jesus has, and he's going to take us to heaven. And with that in mind, let's go into our worship this morning. Next week, uh, we start a new quarter. And so we have new classes. Mike Wyatt will be in here with Fruit of the Spirit. And I'm going to give a quick plug for the teen class. We're going to do what we did Wednesday nights uh, in the first quarter. So it's going to be combined adult and teen class as we go through some stuff and really struggle and break down scripture. I want as many adults as we can get in there as possible. So parents, don't pay attention to your teens when they say, oh, we don't want you in there, because we do. Uh, and if you don't have teens, it's fantastic. It was really neat to see how we had some teenagers start to seek out other people that they're not related to during worship services and, and really get some really great relationships going through that. So please find a class next quarter. Everything's new. I think this quarter's were probably very great. And, and so just find a place where you can come learn and grow next week. Over all the earth you reign on high, every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim, is that you reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again over every thought, over every word. May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord. Cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing. So won't you reign in me again? Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again? O oh Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, and with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you. And it was you, Lord, who sent the Savior, heart and soul, Lord, to every man. It is you, Lord, who knows my weakness. You refine me with your own hand. Lead me, O oh Lord, through temptation. You refine me from within and fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit and take all my sins away. When he comes with shouts of glory and our lives.
lives on earth are through how I long for him to tell me faithful servant well done oh Lord prepare me to be a sanctuary pure and holy tried and true and with thanksgiving i'll be a living sanctuary for you morning everyone the uh, first day of the week has become a very special day for each of us a day that we can get together and fellowship and worship and honor Jesus through the Lord's Supper and I don't know exactly why the first day of the week has become a special day for us the Bible didn't fill in the all the answers, but I, I think maybe because Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week he made several appearances to, to many believers on the, on the first day of the week. And it just seems like it, like it, is a, it became an important day for us, a day that we can get together, honor Jesus through the Lord's Supper. And, and I, I think it's kind of nice that we start out the first day of the week in, in the morning uh, in fellowship and prayer and worshiping our Savior. And will you bow with me this time as we take this bread? Father, we thank you for our Savior Jesus Christ. And we take this bread, remembering it represents his body that he gave as a sacrifice for us, and that he lived sacrificially, teaching us how to be pleasing to you. Uh, what began as a sorrowful moment in the, in the death and burial of Jesus and in that, that it became a joyful event as he rose from the dead, that he conquered Satan and he uh, took our sins away and provided forgiveness for us. We are so thankful for Jesus. Because of him, we're our family. In his name, amen. Pray with me again at this time. Father, as we take this juice, we remember that Jesus shed his blood for us on the cross, that, that his blood provides forgiveness for us, it washes our sins away, makes us pure and holy in your sight. And we're just so thankful because Jesus did this for us. He gave himself so that we could live with you in eternity. And we look forward to that. In Jesus' name, amen. And we just remember that Jesus gave himself sacrificially to us and, and now we have a, a, a time to give back to Jesus in, in a sacrificial way when we give back to uh, from, the, from what Jesus has, what, from what God has uh, given us we give back a portion of that at this time to, to use for his glory for his kingdom and he could do this without us but he chose that he could that we he would work, work through us that that we we could uh, be honored by serving him in this way. Would you bow your heads with me at this time, Father? Thank you so much for giving us this time to to remember how much you have blessed us 
in many countless ways that we can't even remember or keep track of all that you have done for us. At this time, we give back from, uh, from what we have prospered uh, throughout the week in a financial means that we uh, use it for your glory. And we pray that you guide this use, that everything that is used for will give glory to you and for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, please, as we let the children pass to Bible Hour. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black, brown, white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Song before the sermon will be Come Thou Fount. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me ever to adore thee, may I still thy goodness prove, while the hope of endless glory fills my heart with joy and love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I've come. And I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood oh to grace how great a debtor daily i'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter mind my wandering are to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Please be seated. Scripture reading this morning is found in 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 13. I was going to read something else, and Wayne told me not to, so. If you want to follow along in your Bible or your phone or whatever you got, please do so. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they do. Do not be idolaters of some of them were. As it was written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up and to indulge in revelry. We cannot commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples, 
and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of all ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so that you can endure it. Good morning, Eastwood family. Ken always makes me a little nervous. He said, I'm going to come up with something. I'm going to give him like the 119th Psalm to read. That's only 176 verses long, so. Oh, so good to be with you here this morning, and I just can't say enough of what a, a wonder t wonderful time that we had at Vacation Bible School, and I'm glad that they, they leave up uh, some of these decorations around, so some of you that weren't able to be there to see the, the kids and the teachers and helpers and all the activities, uh, you get kind of get an idea of what all happened. And so we, we thank uh, Matt, we thank all the other ladies that were involved, all the helpers, all the volunteers, the cooks and the chaperones. We just give uh, thanks and praise and admiration for your efforts. And I heard, what was about 50 some odd kids uh, ended up showing around up yesterday? Somewhere, somewhere about like that. So good number of kids, and hey, that's a number we definitely want to build on for the upcoming years as well. Well, let's fix that then here. What's going on? It says it's green. We'll run upstairs. How's it sounding? I can stand right in front of the pulpit the whole time. Let's go ahead and do that then. And my little clicker disappeared with Vacation Bible School, so... <laughs> Maybe if somebody wants to jump in the water afterwards, you know, so, so we're going to be coordinating together on some of these things on advance in some of our slides here today. Uh, today is our, our final lesson on our, our Marriage Matter series. want to have a, a, a brief uh, series on that, and so we come to uh, lesson number three. We've looked at positive things about marriage, uh, uh, went all the way back to the very beginning out of the book of Genesis, and we saw how we need to leave father and mother, and how we need to do those activities that we cleave to one another if you're married, and to become unified. And then uh, we talked about what are some behaviors that we need to um, dismiss from our relationship, something that we're always fighting against, and that is selfishness, and how we overcome selfishness with agape love and phileo love and that romantic love that we read about in the Bible. But in today's lesson, this is going to be something that uh, all can relate to. Here is something that the Bible literally says we need to run away from. So if you have your Bibles handy, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I'd like to read verses 18 to 20. To you all here this morning. We read, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside of his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own, you were bought at a price. Therefore, Therefore, honor God with your body. What we're going to do is we're going to go back to the Old Testament. We're going to look at two examples, one negative, one positive, on who took this advice to heart. We're going to begin with King David. Let's start with a negative example first, and then we're going to look at a, a positive example. So let's turn back in our Old Testament part of our Bible to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 11, 1 to 5, David and Bathsheba. 2 Samuel chapter 11, 1 to 5. Here's what scripture has to say. In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. Now one evening, David got up from his bed and he walked around on the roof of the palace. 
and from the roof he saw a woman bathing. Now, a woman was very, the woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to find out about her. And the man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to her and she came to him and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness, then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. So in this passage, and in another text that we're gonna look at, we are gonna see the stages or sequence of events that can lead up to an affair, both a physical affair and an emotional affair. And so guys, follow along as uh, I give you the clue. So let's do one click, proximity. Proximity talks about the closeness of the people that we are around. Proximity could be at work, it could be at school, it could be in the neighborhood, um, it could be at the gym, it could be a family friend. For David, he was up on top of his palace and he looks out and in proximity to him he sees somebody. Next click. Attraction. David noticed that there was a woman and she was out bathing and she was very attractive. He fell in lust, not love with her. The adrenaline was flowing, the chemicals were flowing in his body. It did not matter that she had a ring on her finger. There was a physical longing and attraction for this woman. Next, a seductive statement. After he found out who she was, Bathsheba, she was, a, uh, she was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, the daughter of Eliam, but that still did not stop him. He was the king and he was going to get what he wanted. And so he invited her to come to the palace and he slept with her. Number four, the illusion of invisibility. He must have thought to himself, no one will know. No one will find out about this. Perhaps even God would not know. He was wrong on all accounts. Lastly, number five, sexual activity. David had his way with Bathsheba, sent her away. But what a mess that moment of pleasure created for David. And it would get worse before it got better. She comes back and tells him that she is pregnant, verse number five. David has plan A, B, and C to try to cover up this affair that he's had with Bathsheba. Plan A, he brings her husband back from the battlefield. His name is Uriah. He brings him to the palace, asks him lots of questions about how the battle is going, sends the gifts to him, tells him to go back to his wife and to his household. Uriah doesn't do that. He goes and sleeps down where David's servants sleep, right at the foot there at the, at the palace. David finds out about this, invites him back in. Why didn't you go home? He tells him, hey, the Ark of the Covenant is out in the field. My fellow soldiers are out sleeping in tents. That my general is out sleeping in tents. How can I go ahead and do that? Go back to my wife and my family. I'm not going to do such a thing. And so David gets him drunk and tries to send him back out to his wife and to his house. He does not go. He sleeps right there with the king's servants again down at the, uh, at the foot of the palace. So David has plan number C. I'm going to send him back to the battlefield, this city of Rabbah that they have besieged, put him in the front of the battle, withdraw from him, he's going to get killed in battle, and that's exactly what happens. But I want you to look with me in chapter 11 there at the very end in verse number 27. After Bathsheba had spent her time in mourning, he invites her to be part of his family. Verse 27, at the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife and she bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Allow that to sink in on your hearts and minds. It displeased the Lord. So now there is going to be a confrontation and there is going to be a confession that is made. Nathan the prophet is going to be sent uh, to speak with David. Nathan tells this amazing parable that totally replicates exactly what David had done with Bathsheba. And we're going to pick up in verse number 7 of chapter 12. Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all of this had been too little, I would have even given you even more. 
Now, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Amorites. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your own. This is what the Lord says, out of your own household, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. Before your very eyes, I will take your wives and give them to the one who is close to you. And he'll lie with your wives in broad daylight. That's going to be his own son, Absalom. You did it in secret, but I will do this thing in broad daylight before all Israel. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said, the Lord has taken away your sin. Uh, you are not going to die, but because you are doing this, you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt. The son born to you will die. Oh, what tremendous consequences David had for his sin, his adultery and immorality with Bathsheba. The sword would never leave his house. It's difficult in a family all on its own, but to know that there's divine judgment coming upon your house, and as you read the rest of the history, yes, he has a very conflicted house. And yes, his own very own son will commit immorality with David's wives, his, his harem. In broad daylight, he had done it in secret, and now Absalom's going to do it in broad daylight, and this son, this precious child, is going to die. And it just breaks your heart. And it breaks our heart when we see people fall into similar sins, and they experience great pain and judgment upon their family and upon their lives and upon their relationships. So that's a negative example. But let's look at a positive example. Go with me to Genesis chapter 39. Genesis chapter 39, let's look at the patriarch, Joseph. He runs into a similar circumstance. Joseph had been sold into slavery by his very own brothers, taken down to Egypt. There he is purchased by a man by the name of Potiphar, who happens to be the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard. Potiphar notices that the Lord's hand is upon Joseph. Everything that he touches is absolutely blessed. And so he puts Joseph in charge of everything in his household except for the food that he eats. But let's pick it up in verse number 6 to verse 12 and sees what, see what happens with Joseph. So he left in Joseph's care everything that he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except for the food that he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though, he spoke, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. And one day he went into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside. She caught him by the cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. Again, we're going to look at these stages of seduction. Stage number one, proximity. Proximity. David and Potiphar's wife, were in this, or, uh, Joseph and Potiphar's wife, were in the same house. He can't help but be in some kind of proximity with her. She had a second one, an attraction to him. She noticed that he's well-built and handsome. He's a fine-looking young man, and she is attracted to him. She took notice of him. Number three, the seductive message. She says, I want you to come to bed with me. Joseph refuses. She persists. She asks more than just one time. It's almost like day after day after day. She is demanding of this of him. Seductive statements. Apparently, she had that illusion of invisibility. And no one will know. Servants aren't going to know. My husband's going to know. Um, you know. How is this going to be a problem for us? But notice number five, that the sexual activity was avoided. Joseph turned to his devotion to God. How can I sin against God? He turned to his devotion to loving his neighbor as himself. My master, you are his wife. He's entrusted everything to me except for you. How can I sin against him? 
How could I sin against you in, in this way? We know the rest of the story. She grabs a hold of him and he runs away from the situation. Yes, she will frame him. He will end up going to jail for a period of time. But the Lord's hand was still upon him. Even though he had been in slavery, the Lord's hand was upon him. God blessed him. He's in prison, the Lord's hand upon him. God blesses him. He sees favor from the warden. Eventually, within a few short years, David becomes prime minister of all of Egypt. Notice the blessings that come when somebody follows after the commands and clear instructions of the Lord. So, what clear lessons can we learn from David's example, from Joseph's example? Let's go to this next slide. Point number one. Run, do not wait, run, run away from this temptation. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside of the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. 2 Timothy 2, 22, flee the evil desires of youth. Number two, treat sexual temptation like a deadly virus. Here's how I'd like to explain that. Imagine the, uh, the, the dreaded and deadly Ebola virus. A lot of times we hear about this terrible virus breaking out in Africa. And you see the great mortality that's associated with this virus. And people that go over there to inoculate people and to try to stop and stave the spread of this virus, they have to have incredible medical equipment upon them. And only the very gifted and best trained of doctors that understand these things can work in these environments. They would not have a very casual and flippant approach to this. And so think about this temptation um, in these kinds of relationships. And people say, I take a casual approach or I can get close to the fire, but I won't be you know, tempted to be going on beyond what I, what I need to do. And, and here is a command of God that says, no, you run, you flee from these kinds of temptations because it became, beca can become so overwhelming just like it did David. Here was a man after God's own heart and he fell into this temptation. But there's a way out. Ken read about it just a few minutes ago. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13, we have this promise that we can hold on to. No temptation has taken you except what is common to mankind. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. You can stand up under it. Point number three. Let's stay off the rooftop. <laughs> you get the point, don't you? David was at where he shouldn't have been. The king should have been out leading his armies in battle. Instead, he was up on top of the rooftop there, and he was seen and participating in things he should not have, have done. So we've got to not be naive. We realize that there are folks with mindsets of David as he was on top of that rooftop. There are people like Potiphar's wife that exist in this world. And so we're not going to be naive, but we're going to be prepared. We're not going to isolate ourselves from living in the world, but we're going to insulate and we're going to prepare ourselves when these situations happen. Now we're going to go to the next one. I want to make this very current time relevant. We need to be careful of the online rooftops. You see, when we think about our, our PCs and our smartphones and our virtual reality games and... Uh, and our uh, uh, laptop computers, they're tremendous tools and gifts, and so thankful for all of those things, but you know, they can be used in very, very inappropriate ways. And it, and it can become our online rooftop that we have to be exceedingly careful for. You see, pornography is nearly as addictive as any kind of drug like cocaine or methamphetamines or heroin. Uh, many literally have to go through physical treatment centers to overcome their addiction to pornography. Looking at this little book on the, on the slide here, The Drug of the New Millennium, The Science of How Internet Pornography Radically Alters the Human Brain and Body. Mark Castleman, he did a 10-year study with 10,000 families, 10,000 families, 
And he points out that the more that you see a pornographic image is, the more you want to see, the more that you see, the more addicted that you can become with these things. And so it becomes more than, you know, I just thought not to look at that anymore. I mean, it literally can become a stronghold in your life that you're going to need lots of help to be able to overcome this. Number one, uh, selected search topic on the internet. Guess what that is? It's, it's a three-letter word, sex. There's over 4.2 million known separate and distinct pornographic websites. That's growing by the hundreds and thousands every day. One out of five men, one out of eight women view pornography in the workplace. Average age of first exposure, 11 years old. Some of the most prominent users of pornography, young boys between the age of 12 and 17. I'm mindful of what Jesus said about if somebody allows these children that believe in me to fall into sin. Matthew chapter 18, 5 to 7. Whoever welcomes such a child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. So we need to guard our children's hearts. Well, what steps? Next slide. What steps can uh, Christians take in this battle for moral purity? Let me give you a few to consider and think about, okay? First of all, I want you to consider about drawing close to God. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. That's James chapter 4, verse 7. So let's build up our spiritual life. Let's develop our relationship with God. Remember, Joseph, how can I sin against God? That helped put a good stop sign in his heart and in his mind because of his relationship with God. If you happen to be married, develop that relationship with your spouse. Those things that I've been trying to talk about of, of clinging to one another and leaving one another and doing those things that make you united and fighting against selfishness, which always tries to rear its ugly head up in our relationships. I mean, just develop and strengthen that relationship. Maybe you might want to remind yourself of some of these things that I've talked about, some of these scenarios that happened with David, that happened with Joseph, and we see happen all the time that how, what can lead to this kind of behavior taking place. I think you've got to be honest. Honest with yourself, honest with God. If you're married, honest with your spouse. You want to be transparent. You want to share your passwords. You have no secrets. On your smartphone, on your laptop, on your PC, we're a family. We have become one. And so, not that I don't trust you, but we help one another be accountable in the situation. We want to set healthy boundaries with those that are of the, the opposite sex of us, of, of that environment that we find ourselves in. And, and good families have good boundaries in place. And they've, they've talked about that. And before you accept a friend request, you might want to bounce this off of your spouse and make sure that they're comfortable with who you're allowing in your friend group. Again, we're not trying to isolate ourselves, but we're trying to insulate ourselves and, and practice some smart things in our relationships. We might need to block certain channels on our TVs, put filters on our, on our computers, and be extremely, extremely careful the kind of searches that we do. We want to uh, never be afraid to make radical, uh, radical behavior change, do we? Jesus talked about, he talked about, with like hyperbole, about plucking out your eyes and cutting off your hands. What was he trying to say? Hey, take some extreme measures into overcoming and combating sin. Don't literally do that. But have the kind of attitude like I was talking about, treating this thing as kind of something that's deadly and it's spiritually deadly for you. And so I've got to be wise about how I uh, conduct myself and how I interact in the world. And then lastly, you might want to seek righteous fellowship. Iron sharpens iron, doesn't it? Yes, evil companions can corrupt good morals, but what if I surround myself? What if I'm developing relationships with other good, wholesome couples, other good friends that only want my, uh, only want my very best in, in, in mind and practice, surrounding myself in life? For those of, of you that are single, have that Joseph-like attitude. How can I sin against God? 
How can I sin against others? Let me use this as a time that I can truly devote myself to the Lord and to his work. Now let's move to the next slide, if we will. For those that have failed, for those that have failed, you're not alone. You're not alone. For what God has made good in your life, Satan wants to use it for harm and evil. Bring your sin and your struggle to light of Christ and the truth. Notice this word, this verse. John 3, 21. Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that th what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So it starts by taking personal responsibility. When David was confronted because of his uh, affair with Bathsheba. He didn't deny it. He says, I have sinned. Personal responsibility. I have sinned. Think of the tax collectors. He went down to the temple to pray. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Personable, personal accountability. Forgiveness is available. Forgiveness is available. The minute that David said that he had sinned, Nathan, the prophet of God, said, God has forgiven you. Isn't that amazing? The amazing grace of God. He had sinned greatly, but God had great forgiveness for this man of God. For the tax collector, he was justified. That means he was acquitted of his guilt before Almighty God. 1 John 1, verse 9, if we'll confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Lastly, go and sin no more. You remember in John chapter 8 about the woman that was caught in adultery? Now the law at that time said that somebody caught in adultery should be stoned to death, that she should die. Jesus reminded the crowd that had violence in their eyes and in anger in their heart that day, ye or you who are without sin cast the first stone. And they began to leave starting with the oldest down to the youngest. Jesus asked, where are your accusers? She replied, there are none. Neither do I condemn you. But what did Jesus leave her with? Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. Again, light dispels the darkness. Where light enters, darkness cannot stay. So let's look at our hearts and our lives and our relationship and say, hey, is there an area that I need to have the light of God's truth to shine upon in my life. Because here's the blessing that all of us want to have. Jesus talked about it in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart for what? For they will see God. You want to have a closer relationship with God? Strive for purity in your heart. In all areas of your life, you'll be amazed at how close you will draw to God. Submit yourself to God. The devil will flee from you. You need to respond to today's invitation. Won't you come as we stand and as we sing and are led in this song by Brother Matt. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, he all my griefs has taken and all my sorrows And in temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken and all my idols torn. From my heart and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me 
and Satan tempt me sore. Through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. Fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. A wall of fire about me, I've nothing now to fear. With his manna he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory to see his blessed face, where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. If you'd bow with me. Lord, just thank you for letting us be here today. Thank you for letting those who traveled make it here safe. Lord, be with us as we go from here and, and keep us safe. Help us to keep in mind all that we learned and, and be there for each other and encourage each other to follow you and everything you have for us to do. And please just help us to be strong enough to avoid temptation and sin. Be with everybody as we leave here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Closing song will be at 123. If you need to get your children, please do so now. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faith. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Therefore I will hope in him. You're dismissed.